All right, guys, welcome to the 21st Century Physio Podcast. I'm really excited to bring this special guest here today. It's a colleague that I actually went through university with and who's gone on to wear many hats and do some amazing, wonderful things in the physiotherapy industry. The man I'm talking about, of course, is Peter Flynn, famous from PhysioFit. He's got uh, two clinics currently in South Australia, in Adelaide. He's part of the clinic mastery team and also one of the heads of the iMove U. So it's a real honour to have you here today, Flinny, and thank you for joining the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, my friend. Now, mate, you obviously, we obviously went through university together. Uh, we studied together and we've sort of gone our separate ways for the last, you know, seven, eight plus years. Give me a bit of an update where you're at and what you're doing because you are doing, you know, a remarkable amount of things. Where we're at at the moment, it's, where should we start? We might start with the, the physio fit, hey? Oh, let's go for it. So physio fits at, at the moment, we, we actually just won the South Australian Telstra Business Awards. We made the finals of the nationals and we were definitely not the winner there, but we were happy to be amongst that crowd. That was pretty cool. Uh, there was an incredible winner. Um, you know, they've, they've done massive things. They put 50,000 homeless people in homes over the past three years. If you're going to lose, you want to lose to them. <laughs> Dignity, incredible company. Check them out. We currently physio fit. We've got two clinics, two large multi-D clinics in Adelaide. And, you know, in Adelaide, having two of anything is pretty big these days. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> all down there. But we've got about 25 team members off memory. We, and that, that includes our admin team, who are amazing, by the way. We have physiotherapy, massage therapy, podiatry. The podiatry is run by uh, Melissa Zachariah, who's my business partner's wife. And we're super proud of what we've created. We're, we're really, really excited about what the future holds. We really want to create that supermarket or that Bunnings of healthcare where you can have everything under that, that one roof. Like that's our vision for that. You know, we've got an author pod that's going to start consulting uh, soon in talks with people like dietitians that are wanting to sort of join up with us a little bit. So lots of cool things on the horizon there. We're really excited. As far as clinic mastery goes, Sorry, <laughs> clinic mastery. At the moment, where we're where we're at with that, we're helping more than I think it's just over 150 clinics now that we're helping to grow their business, to systemize the behind the scenes of the business, to allow them more time to work with their team, work on you know if they want to be seeing clients, work on their clients, and to also just get their life back a bit. Because as a business owner, I can attest to, and I'm sure many others, that you leave a 40 hour a week job to you know maybe earning eighty thousand dollars a year to do a hundred hour week job earning sixty thousand dollars a year and it looks really really awesome from the outside at times but you, you do really miss out on a lot of stuff if you can't create those systems and structures within your business and there's this there's this almost this i guess theory or, or vision that people have that if you're an awesome practitioner you should then go and, and open a business but it's really hard because being a business owner and running, running a business is very different to being the best physio or the best osteo or the best chiro. They're completely different worlds, but we seem to put them together that if you're good at one, you must be good at the other. Uh, whereas, in fact, you, we typically don't get taught anything about business. And so we're, we're pretty bad business people when we start. You know, I feel sorry for everyone who came in contact with me as a business person three years ago, even last week sometimes. <laughs> so that's really cool. Sorry. So how did you go about developing those skills? Those skills as a business owner? Mm. A few things, really. Uh, the first one was joining up with Clinic Mastery. We were their first ever client. <laughs> that, that was really, really big. So just learning from people who had been there and done that before, who'd been through you know, the, you know, the tough parts, the ups, the downs, and you know, by no means was their, were their businesses perfect but it's, it's someone who's done what we wanted to do. And so we're able to learn the systems, the structure, the mindset from them. And then the other massive thing for me is Audible. It's actually going and reading and listening as much as I can to some of the best minds in the world. You know, your Simon Sinek's, your Gary Vaynerchuk's, Grant Cardone, like all these people, you can take fantastic thing, things from those and implement them within your own business the next day. So what are you reading at the minute or listening to? I'm listening to Influence by Robert Cialdini. 
Fantastic. Uh, really, really great book on why people make decisions. That's a big, uh, big point in healthcare, I guess. And so decisions, I guess, around going into business, you touched on some issues associated with people, you know, it's moving from that job, which is 40 hours a week, going to that job, which is 100 hours a week. Mm. Why do you think some of these things happen? And how do you work with business owners to, you know, um, get them to where they want to go? That's a really good question, Steve. And I think <laughs> <laughs> it's, there are many different reasons why, why I think that it, that it happens that you start working so many hours or you start doing that. And the first one is that, you know, you want to succeed, you want to be successful and it does take that initially. I don't know any business owners that have gone in and said it's actually really easy in that first year or two. It is a slog. It is a hustle. It is going to be hard work. But if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, then it, it absolutely is worth it. And I wouldn't change it myself. You know, I'm really, really happy with the path that I chose. And how do we help people through clinic mastery with those types of things? It's by helping them with a, the mindset of being a leader. It's that that's hard. You're not born to be a leader. Many people haven't managed people before um, when they're in health. We help people like we help people to get out of pain, to hit their goals, but it's changing that mindset from being, you know, I'm, I'm the number one practitioner. I'm the best, which is really nice. It's your, it's your ego a little bit. Everyone wants to come and see you. It feels awesome to changing that and going, your job is no longer to be the best therapist as a business owner. It's not, it can't be. Your job has to be the best leader. And to be the best leader, you have to support your team the best. And that can be a really tricky change. And I love what you guys are doing with the I Move You stuff. So you're creating a whole new generation of leaders um, by the looks of it. Tell us a bit more about your role there and how you became involved with the I Move You team. So I Move You, so that was originally founded by Michael Risk. Fantastic, fantastic person to listen to if you ever get a chance. Super interesting. He's also a massive Pokemon fan and he'll love that. <laughs> Pokemon Go, get around it. We won't hold that against him. We won't hold that against. Oh, I love poker myself. Now, when it was May last year, so it was May 2018. So Mick had just started it and we, we sat down for, for a beer. I think it was in Brisbane. And we talked about what our vision was. Andrew and I were looking at doing something similar at the time. And at that time, Andrew, my, Andrew Zachary, who's my business partner, Mick and I had just come on as coaches for Clinic Mastery. So we're starting to work together in it and, a close environment there and at that stage Andrew and I decided to come on as directors of I'm of you with Mick and essentially you know work in the different silos of that business to start growing and helping more more allied health professionals to get the most out of their career because there's a, an interesting stat so physio you study for four or five years maybe six if you fail something and after five years 40 percent of physios drop out of the profession which is incredibly large. And that kills me, right? Because I love physio and I know that we help people. Like we do an incredible job of helping people. We get people out of pain, back to what they love doing, out of chronic pain, a lot better job than, you know, painkillers and injections, etc. But the issue is if people are dropping out because they're disillusioned with what it is, then is that, is that a failing on us as leaders within that industry? And how can we reduce that dropout? If we keep more good physios in, we help more people. And where do you think that disillusionment comes from? Hmm. This, is, this is a topic we actually talk about very often. There's many, many different things. I, I think some of it comes from university, the university level of going, well, at university, you'll see your chronic back pain. You don't have to learn rebooking, you know, especially for private practice. People just come to see you and there's no other real duties. You don't understand what private practice is quite like. And it's funny, I actually used to say, you know, the university system's letting us down. And then recently I talked to someone in the uni system who said, you know what, we'd love to put more private practice stuff in there. However, we've got to tick off, you know, the accreditation so you can actually be qualified as a physio. And if we don't do that, then you're not a physio. So their hands are tied too. So, you know, somewhere along the line, we, we do have to see some change in the university system, but it won't actually come from the university itself initially. It's going to come from what, if the accreditation process is for the uni course to, you know, to make you an allied health professional. Um, but I think that's where a lot of the delusion comes from. It's just people, they, they live in one world at uni and when they come out, it's a very different world. 
and there's this massive gap and they're like, whoa, didn't expect that. What? <laughs> I've got to do this and this. What? What is this? This is what we did. <laughs> so what does the ideal physiotherapy or allied health course um, look like to you? What does the ideal course look like? All right, I'm going to have to put loyalties on this thing soon, mate. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for me, the, the ideal course... I sit in the camp of I'd love to see people pick a stream throughout university and go down that where it might be like the first two or three years are very generalized and you do everything. You do your cardio respiratory, you do your aged care, you do all the different areas, but then in your final year or your final year and a half, you get to go, right, I'm going to be, I'm going to work in a, in a hospital and you get to really hone in on what's going to make you the most elite physio coming out of uni to work in a hospital. Or you say, I want to work in private practice. So there's a stream in getting you ready and getting you feeling confident to actually leave university and start working as a physio in that field. So I think to me, that's, that's ideal. Um, I, I know it might be hard to start choosing, you know, through university, but other, other degrees do it. Other degrees are like that. We have to sort of pick streams throughout. I think it would add a lot of value. Um, the hardest thing would be once you finish your uni and you're qualified as a, private practice physio and you wanted to then work in the public system, would you have to do further study? And I think that's completely reasonable to expect because I look at people who work in private practice and I go, you could go and work in the public system. You absolutely could, but would you be good at it? Probably not. And the same goes the other way. So to get the best for our patients, I think if you are going to change completely the type of, of therapy that you're doing, there should be some extra study involved in that. Fantastic. And I think, look, that, that brings up, you know, an ideal point, I guess. When you came out of university, uh, we had a conversation about your journey, I guess, um, and about, you know, what you were, you know, planning on embarking on. And, and I sort of uh, say a bit red faced now that, uh, you know, you were telling me, look, I'm going to open my business straight out of university uh, and start to open my practice. And I said, look, maybe you should just get your skills down pat first for a couple of years before you then uh, start to go out into practice. And now you've obviously running very two very successful businesses. You're helping you know, with great expertise, helping people grow their businesses. What would you say to others who are going to embark on that journey? Because from what I see, you know, speaking to um, thousands of healthcare professionals around the world, everyone's opening up a practice these days. So what are some of the things that you'd recommend to people going down that path that you did? Would you recommend it? Well, firstly, people said a lot, a lot meaner stuff than that, Steve. <laughs> or a lot harsher on me than that. So don't you worry about saying you should, you should focus on the skills to start with. Many people were like, "Wow, you're going to do that? You're going to fail." <laughs> so that uh, it, it was interesting. It was an interesting period. Uh, the, the reason I did, I actually, I did work for six weeks at a small multi D clinic, and I was just really disillusioned with uh, the person in charge of that. What they what they expected were booking wise and and client care wise didn't really align with my beliefs around best patient care and so I was just at the point where it was either open my own thing or quit the profession because that's not what I got into physio for I got in it to help people not to just see people twice a day which was an expectation at one point <laughs> so for me that was the that was the real driver was I I just didn't feel that it, it was right. It was right and I felt that I could do it better. I think looking back on it, it was an incredibly, incredibly arrogant move to do, to say, you know what, I'm just going to open my own thing uh, six weeks out as a physio. But I, I put in a lot of work and I put on a lot of structures to ensure that I was successful. And that's probably the reason why it, it didn't go up in flames. I... I got a friend of mine who's a physiotherapist who I paid to mentor me. So knowing that I wouldn't have a, a senior therapist because it was just me, I got another therapist and I said, Hey, is it all right if I pay you X amount per week and I can come and do 30, 60 minutes of PD with you? So that was massive in itself was putting in, in place a structure to do that because you need PD. You can't just learn everything from the internet. Dr. Google is fantastic, but it's really nice to be able to have someone who can bounce ideas off of off of as well getting a good accountant early on is really important like massively important for anyone looking at opening a business as, as health professionals 
I mean, I, I, I'm different. I love numbers. The many health professionals I work with, they hate numbers. They absolutely hate it. And they don't look at their P&L. They don't look at their zero. They don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. They're just like, oh, there's money in the bank, so I think it's okay. <laughs> this, it's a very poor way to run a business. You have to understand your cash flow, your balance sheet, your P&L, and it has to you know, support you and your business moving forward so you can make decisions. So accountant is a big one. Another big one is to you know, spend the money on a lawyer. You know, have a solicitor who's going to help you with setting up any contracts. Don't write contracts yourself. You're not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, any lease negotiations, those types of things are really important. And then a mentor, I think, is, is huge. There are lots of different mentors. Like I said before, we're with, we are Clinic Mastery. We help people to grow their business through improving their client experience, their leadership, their mindset. There's lots of different ones out there. I think it's just look at all the different ones and go who resonates the best with you and go with that person. I'm super biased. We're the best by far, but, you know, <laughs> massive little plug there. But not everyone will resonate with us and that's okay. But I think it's important to find that person who you do resonate with because that's what's going to help to grow your business the fastest. Having the systems and the structures behind the scenes to ensure that, you know, you can step back a bit, you can work on the business, you can hire people, you can make good decisions. Learn from people who've been there before, who've made those mistakes, who've been successful. What would be, you know, some of your top tips for someone, um, you know, you've obviously ticked off the behind the scenes stuff in regards to, you know, setting up a good foundation there. But what yeah. about in the practice, if you're starting up a new practice, which you've done over the last, again, for your second practice over the last 12 months or so, what would you recommend to people going down that path from in the clinic environment and that client experience side of things? Just, just to clarify, you talk about what, what would you include from like a, a client experience point of view? Correct. Yeah. All right. So I think we're, we're moving into the era where it's no longer just healthcare as people come in, they get their healthcare and they leave. It's, we're, we're past that now. We're, we've moved into the era of Virgin, Uber, Amazon, where you can click and collect and something comes the next day, like Amazon Prime, all these sorts of things. People are expecting better and better service all the time. And that has to come into healthcare too. So we can't just be a stale boring clinic with 10 15 minute appointments we've got to we're going to give people that whole experience at our clinics we one of the first things we did was serving really really nice coffee like really nice bean made coffee really nice coffee machine in a double wall glass you know on a, on a plate little napkin with a little physio fit stencil on top of it little things like that they're huge to that person it just shows a level of care that goes above and beyond We've got 17 different flavors of herbal teas that you can choose from. Now, most people only drink three, but the fact that there's 17 people are like, wow, that's like, again, that's that level of care. We've got free Wi-Fi. you know, nowhere can not have free Wi-Fi these days. Everyone's got their own, you know, their own phone with their own internet. Their free Wi-Fi is just, you know, even McDonald's has it. So free Wi-Fi. We've got massage chairs in the waiting room, you know, looking at having the best technology to give people an incredible experience you know we use the nord board the groin bar you know, technologies we've just invested in anti-gravity treadmill we're looking at the exit system those sorts of things but being able to show that you're different you someone doesn't just come in and they you guess how they're going and you're like oh left seems a little bit stronger than the right or something like that it's, it's that whole experience the whole way through where someone leaves and goes wow i did not expect that from my physio because People don't talk about their physio to their friends. It's not the common thing. But let's say you go, you come to the physio and you have this incredible herbal tea. You're not going to talk about the physio experience itself. You're not going to say, oh, you know, my physio is really funny or we get a really good result. You're probably going to go and tell people about, oh, well, I should have this brilliant peppermint herbal tea today. Like, it was incredible. Where'd you have it? The physio. Like, my physio doesn't. Like, herbal tea at the physio? It, that's a conversation starter. The amount of people that come to our clinic because they've been referred in because of something like that. Now, it might seem dicky, a little bit dicky, but if it's a way you can get people in and you genuinely think you can help those people, then it's, it's an absolute brilliant marketing strategy. 
Fantastic, mate. I love it. I'm going to go out. I think we've only got about you know five or six different types of herbal tea. So I'm going to go and add to the range today. That's uh, yeah, the first up, thing. Mate. The number one thing I'm going to take away from this uh, this podcast today. But look, that's the 21st century you know physio practice right there. But where do you see it going over the next 10 to 20 years? You know? I think we're going to start to see a lot more telehealth. I think that's a huge area that's just got so much growth potential. At the moment now with private health insurance not being able to be used in Medicare over, over telehealth, I think it is a little bit limited. But it's only a matter of time before this does start to, to really take hold. And there's people like uh, Karen Finnan who are doing great things in that area at the moment. So someone really, really good to follow. But I do think we're just going to see more and more of it as healthcare becomes you know, more accessible to more people in more places. You could be treating someone in Malaysia or America or all Europe because they've heard that you're the shoulder guru, you're the shoulder person to talk to or the back person. And as we start to go, hey, maybe our hands-on stuff is a little bit more low-value care, although I still do love you know, manual therapy myself. I think it's a great way to you know, provide you know, touch to that patient, a bit of pain relief, reassurance. Sorry, Adam. But it's, <laughs> you know, as, as we start to maybe pull a bit more away from that as more evidence comes out, then telehealth becomes something that more and more we can actually do with people. And things like PhysiTrack, you know, combine those two together and you can start to really, you know, do an amazing physio consult from another state, another country. Fantastic. And the herbal tea gets posted in the mail? Yeah, look, um, <laughs> it's, it's funny you say that. I did, I did a... Uh, I was talking to someone the other day who did a podcast, not a podcast, it was, a, it was an online meeting they did, an accountant, and one of the questions in a Google, Google form sent out beforehand were, what's your, what's your favourite coffee or beer, depending on the time of day? And then 10 minutes before they start, they had it delivered via Uber Eats. Fantastic. How cool is, how cool is that? That's next level. I love it. I love uh, taking some of those things from other, other areas and bringing them into, uh, into healthcare. It's fantastic. Absolutely. I mean, other things that I, I see happening over probably the next 10, 20 years in health is just more super clinics, more clinics where everything just comes together and it's all under one roof. I see that as being, yeah, just the, the way of the future. People just want convenience. <laughs> So obviously with telehealth, communication is going to be even more critical than it is now uh, with yeah. our, the patients that we're dealing with. And that's something that you obviously have a massive interest in, you know, having a chat at the iMoveU conference a few months ago. Tell us a bit about what we're doing well in the communication space and maybe some things we aren't doing well that we can improve, improve on. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is yeah, stupidly passionate about this. The, the thing that kills me about communication is there's just not enough emphasis on it in healthcare. You know, we talk about, and another, another way of saying communication is your patient therapist alliance. And that's what most clinicians know it as, but let's just call it communication for argument's sake. It's just being able to connect with someone. It's being able to develop a relationship and a rapport so that you can make a change in that person's life. And I think that's, that's something that's often overlooked and throughout uni, I remember, you know, I, I focused so much on my technical skills, but I didn't really ever think about how I communicated that to the patient. And it was never really pressed on me by my tutors or anything, nothing against them because it's probably not what we were being marked on. But I was just reflecting on that and going, well, there was really no emphasis. And then when you get out into the real world and you start treating people, and some people get better and others don't, and they've got the same issues and you've done the same thing, but you're wondering, why is this not working? Why is it just not clicking? Or well, that person who doesn't do their exercises that you've given them, you've given them the best rehab plan, they don't do it. And you go, well, that's his fault. That's on him. Too bad, mate. Gave you the best rehab plan and you didn't do it. It's reflecting that and going, well, have I communicated? Have I developed that relationship with that person? such that I can actually help them to understand why it's so important to actually do those things. And it's reflecting that and going, as a therapist, it's not their problem, it's yours. You've got to internalise that. You've got to take responsibility. You've got to go, all right, well, what could I be doing differently, better? How can I connect more with this person to help them see the importance? Because they do want to get better. They're just not seeing, they're not quite on the same wavelength as you. 
And so for me, communication is huge and we need to become better communicators uh, in healthcare, absolutely. Fantastic, mate. Some great tips there. So, Flinny, for people who haven't heard about you before, don't know where to find you, how do they go about you know, finding out more information about some of the great work you're doing with the iMoveU and the Clinic Mastery team? iMoveU, easiest way to, to find us there is we've got a... Actually, our website goes live today. We've got a new website going live today. It's imoveu.com.au, and that's I M O V E the letter U, dot com, dot au. We have a Facebook group where we, we post uh, free content, live videos pretty much daily. And that's I Move You with a, the letter U again. And that's just the Facebook group. We've got about 4,500 members there at the moment following us. And Clinic Mastery, you'll find us on clinicmastery.com. And that's the easiest way to find us. It's got all the socials links on there. We get lots of free courses, free videos, and free resources. So if, if you're looking at starting a clinic where you want to go out on your own, or you're just thinking about it, you want to know a little bit more, there's so much information on there. And we'd love to talk to you about, you know, what you want to do and the options that you have. Fantastic, mate. So if you have any questions for Pete, make sure you head over and check it out. The Facebook group is fantastic. It's a great resource, especially for those younger clinicians coming out of university looking for someone to mentor them. You've stressed the critical importance of having someone you know behind you to do that. So I highly recommend you go and check that out. Now, before we let you go, Pete, I'm going to last, I need a top three from you. But we're going to go yeah. a little bit different to my normal top three which yeah. is what are the top three bicep exercises coming into summer? Oh, all right. Here we go. I'm glad you asked, Steve, because I probably need to work on this a little bit myself. <laughs> top three bicep exercises. I'd probably start with, I'm a massive fan of just the straight barbell curl in the squat rack to start with. So if you could start there, not only if you piss off the entire gym, but now everyone's looking at you already, which is the main point of doing a bicep exercise. Fantastic. Next one. Great tip. Next one, I'd normally go over to the leg extension machine because if you kneel in front of that, you can actually use that as a bicep curl as well. Yet again, everyone's going to be looking at you like you're real weird. But just remember, they're not looking at you. They're looking at those impressive biceps you've got going. And then lastly, I usually just finish with a bench press. Um, nothing to do with biceps at all. Uh, that's mainly just your, your ego lift. So put as much as you can on the bar, load it up, get two reps out, and then it's probably time to head home. Some great tips there, mate. I'm uh, going to go and hit the gym now and work on those. That is the uh, the Peter Flynn that I know and love there summing that up. So uh, everyone, thank you for joining us again on the 21st Century Physio Podcast. Hope to get you back again sometime, Flynn. We can talk a bit more about some of the amazing things that you're doing. Thank you very much for having me, my friend.